Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, this It's an honor to have you all here today. I'm Jim Brescia, the San Luis Obispo County Superintendent of Schools. First, I would like to thank Mary Sandy and the staff at the Commission for Teacher Credentialing, which provided the Cal Ed grant funding our symposium today, the California Center on Teaching Careers. Uh, a bit of housekeeping. You may use the chat function to uh, enter in any questions that can be answered offline or the uh, items that you would like us to follow up on. Uh, we would ask that people maintain Zoom protocols when they move into the breakout rooms. Uh, we also advise you that there is the network lounge that you can use during the breaks and after the symposium to network with your colleagues. We have an exciting group of speakers today. Uh, we're going to be encompassing research, state policy, um, information in the breakout rooms for everyone. A reminder to refresh your screens when you're leaving one part of the symposium and moving to another part of the symposium. Now, as we begin today, it, it is my honor to, to welcome our state superintendent of public instruction. Uh, Tony Thurman is responsible for, for the largest public system in our country, if you think about that, and, and it rivals some of those globally. There are 6.3 million students in over 10,000 schools that fall under Superintendent Thurman's jurisdiction. Since taking office, Superintendent Thurman has, has worked tirelessly to improve equity, access, opportunity for students, and it is a top priority of his administration. Uh, early in the pandemic, Superintendent Thurman convened stakeholders and groups to see how to best serve and how to best disseminate information to the public. Um, during his tenure in the assembly, um, uh, Tony authored legislation that successfully expanded the free lunch program, bilingual education, grant scholarship programs for foster youth, and additionally, the legislation guaranteed uh, voting rights for students on school boards, further engaging the youth that we serve. Um, he has improved access to families for early education, childcare, and he shifted millions of dollars, not only in funding, but in emphasis towards serving those that are entrusted in our care. It is my honor to welcome our state superintendent who is a, an educator, a social worker, an advocate, a parent, and just a tireless member of our community. Tony, thank you for being here today. Dr. Brescia, thank you. Uh, thank you for your incredible leadership. Um, it's an honor to work with you on so many causes, including on the statewide uh, council of superintendents and advisors who I'm honored that you are part of in helping me uh, try to do the work that is before us. Uh, excited to um, be able to bring greetings to you all on behalf of uh, the California Department of Education and our 6 million students and our 10,000 schools. Um, what a year it has been. Um, it goes without say that we've experienced that the kind of once in a lifetime challenges that only a pandemic can bring. Uh, so many losses, um, and disruption <clears throat> of every kind that you can imagine. <clears throat> and that disruption has uh, played out significantly in our school communities and often for uh, students for whom education already was not delivering well enough for low-income students and students of color. We've watched the pandemic impact those communities. We've watched the impacts of race and bias, the, the murder of George Floyd, a spike in hate against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, bullying against our LGBTQ plus students. And if you think about the backdrop of the nation, you know, more than three dozen states who've created legislation that will harm trans children and others, you know, there are so many challenges that we have to address and use education to end hate. It is hard to imagine as everyone has leaned in during the pandemic to try and continue to provide quality education, it's hard to imagine our workforce and the impacts that that has had on our workforce. And it, to be frank, we were talking about recruitment challenges and retention challenges even before the pandemic. We were dealing with shortages even before the pandemic. We know those shortages are exacerbated. And you know, obviously there are great programs that we'll hear about today from the keynote speakers and from many of the participants and many of the partners, uh, you know, but what we must really turn our attention to how we help a very fatigued workforce. If, if you think about all that our 
our teachers and education staff have done, uh, we know that they're exhausted. Uh, many of them are saying, hey, I'm not available uh, for summer programs. And that's a challenge because summer programs give us an opportunity to accelerate learning and to offset so many of the learning gaps that were exacerbated during the pandemic. Our, our classified staff are also exhausted. If you think about it in context, 500 million meals provided to students during the pandemic. And that in many ways, you know, many of the programs that we've had in the legislature have created the pipeline program where classified staff become certificated staff. And so we just have challenges all around. And so, you know, a lot of districts have reached out and said we want help figuring out how to use the great resources provided by AB 86, um, you know, around staffing, around creating outdoor classes, around COVID mitigation, and of course, accelerated learning. I hope that everyone will use those resources um, for additional staff, for your summer programs, and, and for your enrichment programs, uh, for your classified staff, or for paraprofessionals who, you know, paras who work with students um, in the tutoring programs and things of that nature, uh, while we continue to figure out how we do more recruitment and retention. Uh, for all those educators out there, all those teachers out there, thank you for what you do. And for classified staff, thank you for what you do. We've always known that, you know, unfortunately, because the way our schools are funded, we just don't pay our teachers enough. And even before the pandemic, the working conditions um, have always been such that that was one of the main reasons that uh, drove folks away and that we have to figure out how to solve that. I'm not going to go too far into that because you got a great keynote speaker um, in, in Tarakini who's going to talk about that. And, and, and I've had the, prep, the privilege and the pleasure of learning from Tara from the various types of uh, reports uh, that she has helped to author um, at the Learning Policy Institute over the years uh, on recruitment and on retention. You'll hear uh, from her today as she talks about uh, some of the great research reports, including her work as the lead author of a comprehensive analysis of the impact of the experience on teacher effectiveness. It's called, Does Teaching Experience Increase Teacher Effectiveness? A review of the research. Uh, she's a great researcher, a great speaker. She's helped us on a number of topics, including community schools and other things that we we're interested in. She's a, a former attorney with public advocates and we're excited that she is here today to provide a keynote. And again, also excited that uh, we have uh, State Senator John Laird, uh, who will also be providing keynote remarks, you know, and Senator Laird is uh, serving in one of the most important roles in the legislature as chair of the Budget Subcommittee in Education, uh, really just continuing to shoulder um, important work that needs to happen uh, for our 6 million students and our 10,000 schools and their families. Uh, Senator Laird is no uh, stranger to important work that needs to happen. Uh, in addition to uh, being the senator for Senate District 14, which includes uh, Santa Cruz, Morgan Hill, and Gilroy, uh, and stretches all the way to San Luis Obispo in the South, um, and Big Sur and Monterey, where I was born, um, in the Monterey area. Uh, we're, we're grateful uh, for his previous service uh, in the legislature and as secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, where he has championed incredible environmental uh, kinds of uh, legislation and policies. Uh, you have two great leaders today. Um, Superintendent Resha, I'm gonna turn it back to you um, to carry on from here, but I just wanna acknowledge some great partners too today with Mary Sandy and um, uh, Superintendent Jack O'Connell um, and, uh, and Wes Smith and so many great partners who are here. I know that we can think through um, the challenges that we face and that we'll shoulder the load together and we'll find ways to, as they say, build back better in a way that a system that cares for all of its students in a way that's better and helps us to offset learning gaps. And of course, deal with the social emotional learning needs of our students and the mental health of our staff. Let's face it, this has been uh, the number, so in my mind, one of the top issues we have to focus on is social emotional supports for students, but we must not forget uh, educators administrators, the entire educational uh, team and their families. This will be the top issue that we need to focus on while we also focus on accelerated learning. So looking forward to the learnings that come out of the conversation. You know, uh, perhaps we'll talk today about this issue that we get asked about all the time. Can we get retirees back? Can we find ways to, you know, get around any penalties that they would experience if they choose to come back at this time? 
We'll be looking forward to the answers that come out of today's conversation and how that helps us to address recruitment and retention going forward for our students in our schools. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and, and, and for your service and for your dedication to all of us. Um, it, it's an honor right now to, to welcome Senator John Laird. Uh, I first met John when I was a teacher in Watsonville, and he was serving in the uh, city council for Santa Cruz and as a trustee. And, and John is a, is a dedicated public servant who um, brings with him experience as a, a previous legislator, as a community college trustee, as a locally elected official, and um, a, a nonprofit leader. So, so John, we are just so pleased to have you here today. Um, please join me in welcoming Senator John Laird. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim. I, I'm, for some reason, I'm not seeing my, uh, uh, picture here, but it's um, it's just a pleasure to uh, to be here. And uh, Jim has shown great leadership, uh, particularly on the issue that we're talking about today, but across the educational system. And I rely on him as chair of the Education Budget Subcommittee on the issues that are going on on the ground and the best way to do it. And I know on on the issue of teacher recruitment and retention, his leadership stretches across the state. And it's great to, to follow Tony Thurman, uh, who I'm really enjoying working with and who's provided good leadership. And the, about the only thing that Jim left out of my uh, biography is that my parents had 50 years of teaching between them. Uh, my father in the secondary level, my mother in the elementary level. And one of the great joys about being in Sacramento is I have a few times run into former students of my father who have come up to me and told them the impact he had on them and the impact he had on their life. And it just is the commitment that educators have that, that I saw in him that I see in many of you. And I am right now flunking retirement. Uh, uh, I could be uh, uh, retired and enjoying myself and I'm continuing public service, but many of the people that I went to school with and grew up with and many who became teachers are retiring. And the trends are such, uh, those of us in the baby boomer era, that there was a disproportionate uh, uh, number that, are, that were teaching and retiring. And this year in the budget subcommittee, uh, we actually, whether it was the, the retirement system or whether it was the uh, uh, credentialing, uh, uh, people, uh, one of whom you have uh, later on the program, they don't have the up-to-date statistics yet, but just based on the retirement requests during the COVID time, it appears that retirements accelerated dramatically in the school system. And we already had the trends of not having enough teachers coming in to replace retirees. And so the whole issue of recruitment and retention is exactly uh, what's facing many other things. I mean, we haven't uh, uh, faced the public health system and retirement for the boomers, and, and we really have to uh, change the funding and increase the support for that. There are many things that we wait till it gets to a crisis, and we can't do that with the number of people in teaching. And so, uh, uh, it is very important that we have conferences like we're having today that we focus on these issues. This year in the budget, our job was to do what we could, billions of dollars to help schools reopen and help make sure that the kids that really were disadvantaged in the pandemic uh, uh, got help and make sure that schools not just come back from where they were prior to the pandemic, but we have a 5% increase. And we hope that that really trickles down to uh, the classroom and the teachers in a way that maybe they'll see that there's some incentive to stay in the classroom a few more years. And we also uh, uh, did certain things in the budget this year and the governor is negotiating and considering, we're gonna send a budget to him later next week and it's all a matter of what he chooses to sign that's in the budget. We're trying to negotiate some of it beforehand, but there are certain things 
for retention and recruitment. There was a Gates, a Gates Foundation grant that, uh, that we uh, uh, really uh, uh, appropriated for research. And I think that when you look at this, Jim Brescia is really providing the leadership because we're really talking about best practices. What are the best practices? What can we learn from uh, uh, some places and replicate in others? And I know that's part of today's event. How can we partner with many different educational or training or other institutions to make sure that we get the job done? How do we make sure that it's based on research in a way that we can target it to the right place? How do we have grant funds like the ones I just described help, but make sure that they're there in a sustainable way over time so that we're not just doing things one time and then we're going over a fiscal cliff because we haven't really uh, taken the steps to budget in an ongoing basis. And over all of this, how do we make sure there's equity? Uh, because one of the things in school reopening is, is I'm dealing with, uh, with some senators that have districts that don't have farm workers and they're, they want to have the entire school reopening based on the situation in their district. And yet we have to look across the state where there are some communities that COVID hit at a much higher level. Uh, and where parents might be more reticent to have people come back in person. How do we allow the flexibility to allow for that so that we're not funding declining enrollment, we're making sure that we're embracing kids and they are staying in the system as we move along. And, and that all those things apply uh, to the teacher retention and training. How do we make sure there's diversity? How do we make sure teachers go to the right places? How do we make sure there's enough? How do we make sure they're equipped? Those are big issues and those are hard and we're ready to just partner on those. And that's why I'm excited for the conference today. And that's why I'm excited for Jim Bresch's leadership and the leadership of Tony Thurman and the inspiration we're going to get in a moment from the keynote speaker. So thank you for, for having me here today. And I look forward to working with all of you on these issues going forward. Thank you, Senator Laird. Uh, we, we truly appreciate your dedication to education and, and your, your, your spirit of, of leaning in. Uh, Tara Keeney, our, our keynote, uh, serves as the Learning Policy Institute's Chief of Staff. Um, she's co-authored uh, multiple reports, including serving as the lead author on a comprehensive analysis um, of teacher effectiveness. Um, Tara, Tara is, um, has dedicated uh, two decades of experience working in public education as a civil rights attorney, as a classroom teacher, as a teacher educator. Um, previously, she served as senior staff attorney uh, with civil rights law firm, uh, Public Advocates. She taught English history in the Bay Area school districts, and she served as a faculty supervisor at UC Berkeley. Um, Tara is an excellent example of blending research with practice and, and her advocacy and dedication to the field and to service is, is admirable. And I'm just honored to have you here today. Thank you for sharing uh, your research with us, Tara. Oh, thank you so much, Jim, and um, for organizing this event with SACESA and the California Center on Teaching Careers, San Luis Obispo County Office of Education and the Tulare County Office of Education. And thank you, Superintendent Thurmond and Senator Laird for your leadership and support around these critical issues. Superintendent Thurman, um, you know, we've known each other for several years um, and have so appreciated your leadership in the assembly and now where you sit leading our state's public education system through the biggest crisis that any of us have ever faced. Um, you know, your leadership on accelerating learning and learning recovery and mental health supports on educator diversity, on closing the achievement gap and many other issues has just been instrumental, I think, to the place we're at and the, the challenges that we're tackling. And Senator Laird, the um, work that you've been doing in the Senate 
um, leading the, the budget subcommittee on education and leading us into an era of hopefully what we'll see as new and increased investments in educator recruitment and retention, um, I just think opens up incredible opportunities to solve some of the longstanding challenges that we've faced in the state. Um, so I, I uh, feel a little humble following <laughs> um, the two speakers who kicked us off today, um, but I will do my best to share some of the Learning Policy Institute's research statewide on educator recruitment and retention and to give a, a research-based perspective on some of the challenges that we're facing. And um, Marvin, if it's okay, I will go ahead and share my screen now with some slides. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Um, and I think we're there. Looks good. Um, okay, great. So um, this issue around uh, educator recruitment and retention is one that at the Learning Policy Institute, we've been studying for several years, um, including issues around teacher shortages, both nationally and in California, and evidence-based policy responses to recruit, retain, and support a strong, stable, and diverse educator workforce. Um, I do wanna say I am so honored to be here with this audience today because you um, all, uh, administrators across the state, leaders of, of HR departments are on the front line doing this work every day. Um, it's probably been the most challenging year of your career. And I am, um, I just wanna say thank you for everything you've been doing to shoulder an enormous load, um, getting uh, high quality teachers in front of our students during this incredible, incredibly challenging time. Um, so let's jump in. Today, I want to cover five takeaways um, in, that, that focuses on where we were pre-pandemic in terms of the teacher workforce, the impact of COVID on the teacher workforce, and I want to close out with um, some ideas about how LEAs might leverage some of the new state and federal investments to strengthen educator recruitment and retention. Um, before we jump in, I want to just ground us um, and remind ourselves why this conversation about recruiting and retaining a strong, stable, and diverse workforce is so important. We know that certification, experience, and stability matter for student achievement. We've seen that borne out uh, in large-scale studies from New York, North Carolina, most recently California. Research also indicates that teachers without full preparation leave at two to three times the rate of those who enter fully prepared, creating that, that leaky bucket phenomenon that contributes to shortages and really undermine school improvement efforts. And finally, this is a really core equity issue, as we heard from the superintendent and from Senator Laird, because these characteristics of teachers are inequitably distributed. That's unfortunately a pattern we've seen borne out in decades of research. So it's probably no surprise to you all um, that uh, my first takeaway is that teacher shortages have been a longstanding challenge in California predating the pandemic. In our latest analysis of statewide data, we see that at the state level, California's teacher shortages have continued to worsen. Uh, when districts can't find a fully credentialed teacher, of course, um, they're allowed to hire teachers who are underprepared to fill that position. And so, you know, the numbers of substandard credentials and permits issued are a really good indicator of shortages. And this chart shows you the significant increase in the number of substandard credentials and permits over the past seven years. They now total more than uh, nearly 14,000, um, and they've tripled since 2012. Uh, perhaps most concerning is that emergency style permits uh, have increased seven times. Um, and these, of course, are permits um, that go to the least the prepared teachers. Um, they're growing at the fastest rates, as you can see in the, the, the um, blue part of this chart. Um, and they're issued to individuals who haven't yet demonstrated subject matter competency and typically haven't yet even entered a teacher preparation program. Many districts are interested in recruiting and retaining um, and growing um, a teacher workforce that's more reflective of California's rich racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity. And they're seeking better ways to do this. 
A wide body of research, of course, shows that being taught by teachers of color is associated with benefits for all students, with students of color, especially black students experiencing boosts in academic achievement and graduation rates, aspirations to attend college, among many other benefits. Currently, teachers of color make up about a third of California's teacher workforce, which exceeds the national average of 20%. But in 9% of districts, they have no teachers of color. And in about six in 10 districts, there are fewer than 20% of teachers of color, which again is the national average. So what uh, seems to be causing these teacher shortages? Our previous research at LPI points to three major drivers, a decline in teacher preparation enrollments, uh, increased demand for teachers, and most significantly, teacher attrition and turnover. Enrollment in teacher preparation programs has dropped dramatically. It's down nearly 70% since 2002. We've seen a slight uptick in enrollments. You can see here reflecting in part some of the investments that the state has made to address shortages. But at the rate that we're going, it would take another 17 years to get back to our enrollment levels of 2001. At the same time, that preparation enrollments have dropped, demand for teachers is increasing. Each year districts submit a report to the state with an estimate of the number of teachers they expect to hire. Um, these have increased by more than 40% in the past few years. In part, districts are hiring more teachers to reduce their student teacher ratios and return to the staffing levels that they had before um, the great layoffs during the great recession. Um, but the vast majority of demand is driven by teacher attrition. Um, so that's why our conversation today about retention is so key to solving our challenges. Nine out of 10 teachers hired in California are hired to replace teachers who've left public school teaching in the state. California has a 12% teacher turnover rate. That includes the 9% of teachers who leave public school teaching in the state and another 3% who move districts. Our attrition rate is a little bit higher than the national average. It's more than twice as high as high, high achieving countries like Finland and Singapore, um, Ontario, Canada. Importantly, these rates vary by district. So we see some districts with turnover rates under 5% and others where more than a quarter of teachers are turning over each year. At LPI, we analyze data at the county and district level, and I just want to share for this audience um, that you can look up your county or district level data, um, get a sense of the factors that uh, reflect teacher shortages in your context, like the percentage of beginning teachers, um, your, how your teacher turnover rates and other rates compare um, to others in your, your county and across the state. Um, this map really shows that shortages are not uniform across the state. Some districts have a stable workforce of well-prepared and experienced educators, and others are really contending with high turnover rates um, and relying on teachers who are not fully credentialed. Which leads me um, to the second takeaway that I wanna share with you, which is that shortages really expand inequality. And I think this is a theme that Superintendent Thurman and Senator Laird really hit on I think that's why it's so important for us to understand the nature of shortages in our state, not just because they put stress on the whole system, but because they contribute to the already stark opportunity and achievement gaps that we have. Um, districts serving more students from low-income families have higher turnover rates. They hire more new and beginning teachers. Um, these teachers can certainly be an asset to a growing district, but we also know that students benefit from a stable and experienced teacher workforce. These districts also hire more teachers on substandard credentials and permits. Uh, in some California districts, most, those that are serving the most students from low-income families, more than half of new teachers were hired on substandard credentials and permits, which is, is, is really stark. Um, these conditions have financial costs. Research points to costs of more than $20,000 to replace 
every teacher who leaves a large urban district. Those are costs like recruiting, replacing, onboarding, the HR processing costs. Um, we uh, have a interactive calculator on, your, on our website that may be interesting um, for you to play with and plug in numbers for your district. It could be a helpful tool, I think, if you're trying to make the case in your local district um, for investments in higher retention pathways that while they might require some upfront investment really can pay off in terms of reduced turnover costs. I mentioned earlier that uh, not only are teachers without full preparation generally worse for student outcomes, but they do leave at higher rates, creating that, that revolving door of teachers. And um, all of that really has significant impacts on student learning. Um, the Learning Policy Institute conducted a study of districts, we call it our positive outlier study, where students of color achieved at higher levels than their peers. And we found that of the school level factors, the two most important predictors of student achievement were their teacher qualifications and experience. And specifically, the percentage of teachers holding substandard credentials or permits was significantly um, associated with achievement, especially for African American and Latino students. So I think the question that many people are wondering about is how has the pandemic impacted the teacher workforce? Um, at the beginning, everybody was wondering, are we going to see huge um, retirements, people leaving? Do we actually need more teachers to enable social distancing as schools reopen? There were a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and so we sought to understand some of these questions in a study that we conducted this past winter. Um, and our key takeaway, I think, is that teacher shortages have continued to be a critical problem during the pandemic. We interviewed a sample of California superintendents and HR administrators during the late fall, so November, December timeframe, to understand how they were experiencing um, shortages and the impact of the pandemic in their district. Our interviews were with eight of the 11 largest districts that together serve nearly one in six California students, as well as leaders from nine small rural districts, because we know that the issues that they're experiencing are often unique and, and um, are, they have additional challenges recruiting and retaining teachers. We found that shortages remain a critical problem for districts during the pandemic. All of the districts um, were hiring teachers on substandard credentials and permits. Uh, they reported shortages in math, science, special education, and half of the large districts, which are those most likely to stand up bilingual programs, reported shortages in bilingual education. So those are really consistent with the trends that we've seen in, in the past several years in California. Many districts described a severe sub shortage that's putting additional strain on the teacher workforce, right? They needed subs when teachers were out due to exposure um, to COVID or illness from COVID. Um, and of course the sub supply went down because many subs didn't pre feel prepared to teach in a digital format. I think um, this quote from Superintendent Tom O'Malley um, in Modoc Joint Unified School District on the Oregon border really captures some of the challenges. We were still looking for people up until the day school started. It's hard to develop a plan when you don't have staff to implement that plan. Even, so even if we had more classrooms and we're going to hire more staff to make smaller cohorts, we don't have the bodies. They never showed up. We never stopped hiring. Uh, this is a four minute warning. Great. Thanks, Marvin. So um, I will um, kind of uh, breeze through some of the other findings from this study on the, on the workforce because I want to make sure we have time um, to talk about upcoming state investments and opportunities there. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead. Um, I think we heard so much about um, from Superintendent Thurmond in particular about how teacher workload and burnout are major concerns and from Senator Laird that we're seeing that impact on retirement um, in particular from the state teacher retirement data, which uh, shows that a 26% increase in retirements year over year from 2019 to 2020. Um, the final finding from our from our winter study on the impact of COVID is that teacher residencies and preparation partnerships have really proved important to recruitment. And we heard that consistently for those um, districts that had 
uh, stood up these programs, they had a ready workforce to tap during the pandemic, despite many of the challenges with recruitment. Um, so uh, you're going to hear, I think, from panelists later today about um, some of the recent investments that the state has made to address shortages. This is just a number of the programs. I mean, we've seen significant investments, nearly um, $200 million over the past five years or so. Um, and that was about $300 million, but got pared down at the, uh, during the last budget cycle because of the impact of COVID. Um, and I think these programs are really starting to make a difference you know, through the classified staff teacher training program, for example, which is training more than 2,000 uh, paraprofessionals and other classified staff to become teachers. Um, but um, we, I think the state budget that Senator Laird referred to offers huge um, new potential investments. And that's the, the, the last takeaway that I wanted to share today is really um, a message to LEAs to prepare to leverage these new state and federal investments to strengthen your educator pipeline and support retention. Um, so the state budget that's being negotiated right now and that the Senator mentioned will be sent to the governor at the end of next week all include significant increases in investments for the educator workforce um, both in the pipeline and in supports for the existing um, workforce through the classified staff teacher training program, teacher residency grant program, the Golden State Teacher Grant Program to provide service scholarships to teacher candidates, as well as additional testing flexibility. Um, so I think there's tremendous opportunity ahead to build those programs or expand them if they're um, ones you already have in your district. Um, in addition, federal rescue aid through the American Rescue Plan Act can also be used to support the educator pipeline. And I think for LEAs to think about how they can blend these sources of funds as well um, may be particularly important for making them last for long-term investments and seeding programs that you can sustain over time. Um, so ARPA um, and Carissa, the December package, are bringing about $20 billion in ESSER funds to California for LEAs, and there's tremendous flexibility in how to spend them. The Department of Education recently put out guidance just last week on, on uses of um, these funds to support the educator pipeline, and I, this is word for word from the guidance here, so you can see um, there really is, you have the blessing of the U.S. Department of Education to leverage these funds to strengthen the workforce. Um, so I think um, to recap, um, you know, really thinking about how to prepare now to leverage the significant infusion of dollars to strengthen the educator pipeline and support retention is an incredible opportunity um, for LEAs. Um, I have put my contact info here. Um, so I encourage you to reach out uh, if you have any questions. I know I moved fairly quickly this morning um, and you can access uh, all of the research that I talked about today on our website. I think Marvin will share the slide deck afterwards. Um, and again, thank you for the incredible your work you're doing at the local level to recruit and retain um, the teacher workforce that our students so critically need right now. Tara, thank you again. Um, just, just another moment or two of, of your thoughts on, on, on what you said there at the end about the opportunities to leverage these dollars that are coming forward um, and, and basing that on, on some of the research that LPI has to shore up our profession. Uh, just a few more thoughts that you have on that. Yeah, well, I mean, um... Jim, I think, you know, our research has really um, pointed to a number of evidence-based strategies, and um, I'm happy to go into depth on any of those later here, and I'll share them in the breakout group, groups as well. Um, one in particular are teacher residency programs, which provide that intensive year-long clinical training experience, and that the state stood up through a grant program a couple of years ago. We've launched more than um, 30 of these programs with those grant funds, and the governor's proposed, you know, five $150 million 
over five years to grow that. Um, the research that we've done and that WestEd has done um, shows the impact of those programs just in the first year um, that, that they got off the ground. So I think that's one promising strategy. The classified staff teacher training program, Jim, I've heard you describe the impact this has had in your, in your county in particular, but many counties and districts are taking advantage of that to start with their existing classified workforce who are more likely to reflect the communities that they're serving and support them to, uh, to earn their credential. I think this is gonna be incredibly important, especially now as we're growing transitional kindergarten in the state. That's a whole new challenge that we, I, I hope will get discussed today. How do we leverage these programs in particular? And I think the legislature is already deeply thinking about this to support the growth of that workforce as well. Absolutely, thank you. And I see Superintendent Thurman has his hand up. <laughs> thank you, Superintendent Brescia. As always, I, I just listen to what LPI puts out. I get ideas and then try to introduce bills. And, um, and so we've been doing that for years and uh, it's such incredible work. Tara, I was curious if in your lens, you're hearing anything from other states and the question of retirees, teacher retirees coming back even short term um, to the profession as a short term measure, uh, really just in, in, in view of what's happened from the pandemic. Uh, I know that we have some folks on from the CTC who are going to want to talk about that. Um, I, I'm curious about that. And of course, I loved all the uh, emphasis that you put on on diversifying the teacher workforce um, in residency programs. I think, you know, um, we sponsored a bill AB 520 this year that is focused on male educators of color, you know, and broadening residency support, um, you know, as a, as a recruitment strategy. We care about recruiting all candidates of color, but we, but we thought that um, building out the programs for male educators of color might give a bump um, and, and help in bringing in new candidates into the field. Any, any, any thoughts on that, but, but really about the, the, the retirees who, you know, might reenter. Seeing anything in other, other states in the nation? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to take the second part of your question first, Superintendent Thurman, you know, thinking about how do we make entering teaching more affordable for candidates, you know, the barrier, the cost of preparation is such a hurdle for teacher candidates, particularly for candidates of color, those from low income um, families. So taking that financial barrier off the table, I think it has to be part of the equation. One of the things that we've been thinking about and, and encouraging districts and educator preparation programs to think about is how do we leverage the learning recovery funds in particular, right? ARPA requires LEAs to set aside 20% of their dollars for learning recovery, but, but teacher candidates can be a huge asset in that. They can serve as tutors, they um, can staff summer school and expanded learning programs, right? That's both getting them the clinical experience that they, that they need to grow their skills and offering paid support and meeting district staffing challenges. So I think it can be a win-win-win if we can think creatively about some of those structures. And I think the ARPA dollars really um, demand that right now. And I know everybody's thinking about how they're what they're going to put in their, their plans on that front. On the retirement question, I don't have um, smooth data trends for you from across the nation. I've seen mixed um, kind of retire, retirement data from states across the country and mostly through um, news reports, not any kind of rigorous analysis. I know there was a great concern that we'd see spikes in retirement rates, and we've seen that in California, and it's been mixed in other states, um, as far as I can tell. In terms of bringing retirees back, I think it's a tricky thing because those are, those, you know, are um, older um, educators are more susceptible to COVID and you know, how the vaccine is playing in there, how the variants are playing in there. I think those risk factors are things we just don't know right now. Got it. Thank you, Tara. Well, thank you.